Hello there, we are in the Monster Guitars workshop on a nice, cool autumn evening. And I'm working on the Flame, well it's the Flame 2.0 model with the Douglas fur top and in particular I'm working on the neck because the tune has arrived today. That's nice. So, uh, work on the nut, then get the tuners in, then um, give the neck a once over sand and, and put it into the body. Cutting the nut first of all, um, what I've done in the past is use a pre-slotted nut and that's perfectly valid. I, I don't look down on that as especially lazy, um, uh, convenient things to have. But it just happens that at the nut, my fretboard, including the binding, is just a whisker wider than those nuts are, ever so slightly. It's just a little bit over, I would say, about 43 millimeters, whereas the nuts I have, I think, are either 42 or 43 mils. So they're not quite wide enough for that. I mean, it's not like a you know a classical guitar neck, but it's, it's wider than the nuts I have. So anyway, I'm cutting my own. First time I've done it. And I don't have a metal vise. You would normally do that because you wouldn't want to put a piece of bone in a, in a wooden vise. You would just put marks into the into the vise. You would normally put that into a metal vise, like an engineer's vise or a drill press vise when you were cutting and slotting it. So I've made up for my lack by holding it between these two very hard pieces of decking timber. Are they, they're either quilla or jarra or some other kind of very hard wood. And I've got those in my woodworking vise and they're holding the bone blank. All right, I may make my initial cuts with a hacksaw blade because that's, I mean, it's not a super narrow blade, but it's narrow enough, skinny enough to make the skinniest required slots in a nut. I think I'll do that. Well, I've discovered a nifty online calculator. I imagine there are several actually where you enter all the dimensions of your nut, in this case 44 millimeters, uh, including how far in you want your strings to be from each edge. And then you also enter the dimensions of the string, so how thick each one is. Um, now, that's, a, that's not going to be entirely consistent uh, throughout the guitar's life because someone might change the strings, but I've based it on using a, what's called a set of light strings from 10 to 46. And then it gives you the string spacing for each one. And I've drawn that on as well as I can. Mm, I'm worried that it's not going to be quite right, but look, um, you can only do your best. If it doesn't work out, I'll, I'll, um, I'll cut another one. All right. I've just started off several of these slots and it seems to be so far so good. Let's hope that doesn't change. All right, the neck is approaching finalization. I've um, just given the fretboard a nice polish. I think it's a nice polish. A cut polish job with the buffing wheel on my hand drill and then I rubbed it down with some refined linseed oil. Artists refined linseed oil. Um, you can just use boiled linseed oil. I like this stuff that I use. It's, it's a, a little bit lighter in color. Anyway, here we are. I need to drill the holes, obviously. So I've Got a sample here of the tuners that I'll be using, which I really like, this vintage looking red copper finish. And what I've done is I've got a drill bit. I won't use this drill bit because the hole needs to be larger, but this drill bit is about the size of the post that sticks up here. So that will show me where the string needs to be angled so that the string will just hit the edge of the post and wrap around it. Um, it's difficult to show you, but I wanted to explain what the method that I'm going to be using here. 
I haven't glued the nut in, but it needs to be relatively stable in order for me to do this. So I've just got some double-sided stick tape sitting under it to hold it there for now. So the string's going to come down the neck, over the nut, and a slight angle is okay, you just don't want very much. Okay, so if it hits the, the post at about, about there, because there are three tuners per side, and that's plenty of length for the remaining two tuners. These are the thoughts that go through my head as I do this. And I draw an outline of where that bit is sitting. Okay. Right, so that's where the first one will go. I'll do the remaining five now. Right, I have determined the positions of each hole. I'm kind of putting off the nervous part, the part that makes me nervous. I'm nervous about the part that is yet to come. I suppose once it's done, I won't be nervous. <sighs> Let's go and risk disaster, shall we? It's got a good hard wood on the back and it hasn't torn out at all. Um, I found that using my brand point bits did tear out a bit. They're not very sharp. Uh, slight brand criticism here. Bosch make very good tools, but every time I've bought bits with the Bosch brand on them, whether they be Forstner bits or those um, brand point drill bits, they've been blunt. And as a result, some pieces of work have been damaged. So I'm just using standard twist drill bits here. But I've got the position clearly marked already with a dent. And I'm holding the piece down quite firmly onto a hard piece of wood behind it, which discourages tear out. All right, all seems to be well. Jolly good. I'll just do a test fit of the tuners without attaching anything. I'll just poke them through and have them all sitting there. And then I will um, I'll start to look at finishing the neck. I might finish the neck before I glue it in. No, I won't. No. no. Once I've done a test fit of the tuners, I will glue the neck in. Yes. I tried this technique out first on a piece of Douglas fir that isn't part of the guitar. That seemed like a wise idea. And I like the result I'm getting. It's something I toyed with from the beginning in my mind. And I'm using this wire brush on a drill. I don't have a hand brush, which is what I would have gone for for the sake of being cautious, but actually this is not too destructive, I'm finding. And the effect that it's having is really good. The lighter streaks in the Douglas fir are much softer than the darker streaks. And I don't, I don't know how easily you can see that, but what's happening is the softer stuff is being scraped out by the wire. So it's got a very ridged texture to it. It feels great. I think it looks good. So I will, um, I won't do that middle piece of wood. That's all hard. Uh, but for the Douglas fir portions, I will do this and then I'll give the top a light sand, which won't sand away those ridges. It'll just make the, the ridges that stand up a bit smoother on top. So I didn't necessarily plan to do it this way, uh, but what I have here is not, can I find a ruler? Well, not that it really helps from where you're sitting over there. There isn't a straight line from the top of the carve to the bottom of the carve, just because of the way the chiseling went and the 
the sander went. It's a bit of an organic process, and every time I do this will be slightly different. But I've got quite a concave curve here, so it goes in like that as it heads down, which is kind of nice, actually. Um, getting it smooth was tricky, though, until I realized that I ought to be using this. This is what's called a gooseneck-shaped scraper. I guess it looks like a goose's body, and there's the neck, and the head would be up there or something. But that was really good, uh, to scrape the inside of that. And now I am, I'm, I've just been going over it with some, some sandpaper. That's looking pretty good. Well, I think so. Good is slightly subjective, but you know, it's, it's nice and organic feeling. I mean, the whole thing's organic as wood, but we think of organic as sort of naturally occurring curves, like you know, when you see roots that come out of the ground of a tree, roots of the tree that come up out of the ground, and you know, surfaces that aren't flat. Although that's nice and smooth. Organic, woody. Okay, what would I like to do next? Well, I think I should actually just glue this neck in. Any other refinements are things that I will do once the neck is in, I think. Yeah, let's do that. Right, it's time. It is time to unite the two. You'll see that the neck is oiled. I couldn't help myself. I didn't oil the parts that I'm going to glue. That would be silly. Right, so there's certainly a decent amount of surface in here, surface area to glue here for a good join. That's nice. Let's just put some in, move it around. I've got some cork sanding blocks here to use as calls. They're useful to do that with because they're strong enough to exert pressure, but they're soft enough that they shouldn't do any damage. Which joint should I go for first? Which direction should I exert pressure in? Downwards, I think. Downwards pressure. And the other direction in which it's important for me to exert pressure is this way, because I'm gluing onto this wall of the pocket. Right, well, I don't think it's going to get any better than that. Can't move it, which is good. Okay. Okay, it's in. How badly am I leaking glue? Not too bad, actually. Not too bad, just a little bit. I'll go and get a wet rag and just clean some up. Well, I can easily do so, but that's... That's pretty good. They are united. 